It's my great pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker, Cathy Bell. Uh, Cathy started her career in the steel industry as a, an apprentice at Swindon Labs. I won't say how long ago, it would be rude. And uh, from there joined what was it, probably at the time British Steel Engineering Steels. Chorus Engineering Steels in uh, the late 90s, uh, having various roles in product metallurgy, uh, quality management, customer technical services, and other uh, customer facing and uh, product development roles. And about 12 months ago, uh, left what is Zen Liberty Steels and joined Swansea University on the iSpace project, which is going to talk to us about tonight. So it's my great pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker, Cathy Bell. So a little bit of context. This is, the, we're starting off at the very beginning of the journey. We are only nine months in. So I'm telling you about the vision and where we're going, not what we've actually achieved yet. That's a cue for a second invite. <laughs> so three broad topics or three broad areas today. I'll give you a little bit of an overview. Talk about some project activities that we have progressed and then a little bit of a sum up and a cheeky request from the project manager. So, what is iSpace? iSpace is a very short project. It's only a year and we're pulling together a business case. We're looking into how much it will cost, what the resources are required to set up a research and development industrial scale waste processing plant. And it will be specifically designed to recover material from end of life components. Within that business case, we need to find a location. We need to design the building. Think about what equipment goes in there, the staff and expertise we need, develop a program of research and development, look into small scale commercial activities. And we need to do quite a significant communication activity, which is this sort of thing that we're doing tonight. So the core project team consists of three partners, Swansea University, headed up by Richard Curry, and then Tartar Steel and Salsa Steel. Now, the core project team is heavily steel biased, but the project isn't just about steel. And I'll go into that a little bit more later. So why are we proposing a research and development waste processing plant? Why do we need this separating and sorting plant? Well, I want to zoom out a little bit. Don't think about the project, zoom out and think about things globally. So there's a lot of pressure at the moment to try and avoid where possible using natural resources. There's also a move away from linear economy. So make, use, throw away into the circular economy. So try and reuse, refurbish, remanufacture. And if you can't do that, then recycle. Now, some people, some purists, in the circular economy world, think that recycling is the dirty word of circular economy, but I'm going to present an argument in its favor. We need to eliminate pollution, so reduction of greenhouse gases is the obvious one. And we need to think about how we use our recycled materials. We want to make sure that we're not downcycling, so we're not using recycled materials, for products that are lower quality, lower value, or lower functionality than the original products that they came from. We also need to think about security of material supply, especially in the steel industry. As steel makers move away from BOSS and move towards electric arc furnace, there's going to be a lot of pull on the scrap that's available now. And more importantly, the scrap that's very well segregated and very good quality. And we'll talk about quality in a minute. And we also need to challenge this design the disassembly theory. So how will the proposed plant help? Well, if we can develop processes that make sure that the recovered materials, the recycled materials are good quality and quality defined by the customer, not the recycler, and they're highly segregated. So you're not just saying that's steel, that's plastic, that's glass, but it's steel of this grade aluminium of this grade, glass of this sort. And if we're doing that to a customer specified requirement, so it's a certain analysis, it's a certain shredded size, it's specified in terms of homogeneity, 
and it's delivered in a form that they're happy with, then we can move things on from the current situation. Now, I can't talk from an aluminium, glass or plastic perspective, but I can say from a steelmaking perspective that when we've had conversations with stakeholders that aren't in the steel industry, there is a myth that steel recycling is okay. It's acceptable quality. But then when we talk to the steel makers, they complain about how much contamination there is in there and the way it's delivered and it's uh, in homogeneity. So it's not quite where the steel makers want it to be. So what was fit for purpose maybe 10, 20 years ago isn't fit for purpose now. Some industries, if they use recycled materials, can decarbonize. So this plant, if it can produce recycled materials of acceptable quality, could assist some manufacturers to decarbonize. And then the final point, there really is a need to look at this design for disassembly process. Because theoretically, things have been designed for disassembly, cars, the obvious example. But in reality, it's so manually intensive and so uneconomical and quite often difficult that although it's there theoretically, it's not a practical um, opportunity. And I did say I was going to make a, a case for recycling. Technology moves on, new products evolve, people want new gadgets. So even though there may be some stigma to recycling, if there's always going to be new products on the horizon, there's always going to be a need for raw materials. So if we are going to do that, and we can make them from recycled materials, why wouldn't you? So recycling really ought not to be the dirty word in the circular economy, because it does have some value and some benefit. So who's going to be interested in this plant? Who's going to come and do research and development on separation and sorting? And really it's any organization that's interested in raw material recycling. Anybody who wants to decarbonize and can do so by using recycled materials. Organizations interested in eliminating waste, whether that's physical waste or value. And also anybody who's interested in resource efficiency. And the project team's been targeting who may be our customers and our suppliers. So where will these end of life components come from? Will they just be us throwing things away? Will it be OEMs who have been made to take some responsibility for their components when they come out of service? And will it be an alternative source? And being a new facility, we need to look at funding. How will we operate this? What will the business model be? Will it be conventional funding? Will it be investors? Will it be a mixture? And there's a big question about where this plant will be. And I think it's fair to say that that's going to be the hardest question to answer. Ideally, you want to co-locate it near your customers and suppliers. But if this is a UK facility for UK organisations, then where will that be? If it's a facility that supports still making aluminium, plastics and glass, where's the best location? And we also need to factor in the funders and investors because they quite often have some rules and regulations around where their funding is spent. So it's unlikely that we'll answer that question in this phase of the project, but we will need to answer it very quickly in phase two. And finally, when is all this happening? What's the timeline? So we're currently putting the business case together. That's step one. And that business case will be available in draft at least just after Christmas. And in the next 12 months, we'll need to use that business case to look for funding and investment, firm up the operator model, firm up the products and services that we will offer and decide where that location is going to be. Next step then naturally is commission the build, buy the equipment, install and commission the site. And then we get into the research and development. So five years would be fantastic, but you may be looking five, eight, 10 years down the line. So that's a little bit about the overview, what, who, when, where. But now I want to spend a little bit of time digging down into the project activities. And the first activity that we're going to do deep dive into is the build. This is a concept. 
So what we're looking for is a standard building with some active technology. So active technology is technology developed by Swansea University that allows the building to have a positive impact on its environment. Basically, you can generate electricity, you can moderate temperature, and you can have less of an impact on the surrounding area than maybe a normal building would be. So the first thing is to make sure that we've got a very modern, very green building. Within that then, we will put some industrial scale shredding and separation and sorting equipment. And I'll go into that in a little bit in a, into detail in a, a moment. But I want you to think about internally how that building is set up. So imagine down the spine of the building, you've got your industrial scale equipment. And then alongside that, you've got some innovation bays. And the concept is that organizations can come on site, either finished after they've done their laboratory scale or carry on doing their laboratory scale on site and immediately then upscale that onto industrial equipment. Because how many times have researchers said, I can't get out on plan, the commercial plan's slowing things down. And then the businesses would have said, oh, they're doing R&D again, they're getting in our way. So this concept of having industrial scale research and development is designed specifically to give researchers and organizations who want to collaborate in research a space to do that without having all the pressures of the commercial business behind them. It also will be set up in a way that it's a flexible operation. So you don't have to use all the equipment. So if there's a shredder, a magnetic separator, air separator, eddy current, and other technologies, you don't actually have to use them all. You can use one piece of equipment, you could trial on three pieces of equipment, and you don't all have to use them all in line. You can do a little bit of work, go off to your innovation space, analyze what you've done, come back to your equipment. Now, this is all great in theory, and I'm sure that the research um, world will be quite happy with it, but unfortunately, it will be a very big, expensive operation. So alongside that, we will have to do some sort of commercial operation to make sure that we've got some operational spend. So we will do a little bit of our own generating recycled materials for sale for two reasons. It's another opportunity to do research and development, but it's also a need to generate some revenue. So in terms of the equipment, we are going to start with conventional technologies, a shredder, a few separation techniques, and then build from there. There's no reason why somebody can't request that we look into and give them access to novel technologies, or they may actually want to bring their own technology on site and pilot it and upscale it. There are a lot of separation techniques that are done offline for whatever reason, either because they're not used very often or because they're very expensive and therefore are only used when there's value in the material. But in this plan, even though we'll start with the conventional equipment, the plan is to build and look at a wider range of technologies that maybe aren't used on a regular basis today. And then the other big difference between this plant and a, a typical waste management site is about quality assurance, quality assessment, and chemical analysis. Even after only having a few conversations with potential stakeholders, the manufacturing industries would like to see certified raw materials. So at the moment, for instance, scrap is sold to some very old, ill-defined categories, and they were fine when they were generated and they've been okay for a few years, but they're really not fit for purpose now. So what manufacturers really want to do is to specify what their product, what the product they buy looks like, what it contains, and design it to suit very specific products that they're manufacturing. So a big aspiration with this site is to make sure that post-sorting, chemical analysis and quality assurance is conducted. So if somebody buys raw materials, they know exactly what they're getting in terms of chemical analysis, cleanness, contamination, even the size of the shredded product that they buy. So that's the concept. The other big activity we've done, and this is the one where we've put the most effort in, is a communication program, and we've been engaging with potential stakeholders. There's a vision, 
and that's okay. But if we're going to go to funders and investors, we need to have something solid. And that something solid needs to be backed up by supporters who have said quite clearly, this facility is something that we need and will use. And by the way, this is how we'll use it. So we've been talking to quite a wide category of potential collaborators. We've deliberately started with trade bodies, sector organizations and government organizations because they're the organizations that represent a wide range of organizations. So for instance, if you go to a trade body, they will have a wide range of members. And what we've found is every time we present this vision, we do get a positive response from the trade bodies and the sector organizations. And we've also had positive responses from the likes of BASE and DEFRA and Innovate and KTN. And some of those are giving us letters of support. What we're hoping and what we will push for is that those trade bodies now flow this message out to their members, or at least give our contact details to members so that we can go to the next step because we've got good support at that high level umbrella level, but we need now to start and get the detail from the manufacturers. As you might imagine, we have talked to steel makers. We've got two steel makers actually in the project and we've spoken to two of us, there are two left. So then we can at least say we've had a conversation with the big six steel makers in the UK. And again, we're getting a positive response from those steel makers. But we need to have conversations with the same types of organizations in aluminium, plastic, and glass, and other materials if there's scope. So being in modern times, when you're communicating, the best thing you can do is have a Twitter and a LinkedIn account. So when we thought about this, in order for the likes of social media to be effective, you need a wide range of followers. And we didn't have time to wait for that. So we've asked other projects within Swansea University if they will tweet on our behalf and then retweet. And I'm gonna ask you to do the same. And hopefully by Christmas, we'll also have our own web page. So there will be something for us to direct people to. Now I said earlier, this is not just about steel. It definitely started off as steel. Steel recycling needs to move, it needs to evolve, it needs to provide something that's fit for purpose for today and the challenges in the global economy. But very early on, it became clear that steel quite often is not just used as a single entity, it's used in a multiple material system. And if you want to recycle an end of life component, and we'll use the obvious one, a car, if you strip the steel out, you'll also end up with a pile of plastic and glass and rubber and textiles. If you are claiming to work within the circular economy principles, what do you do with those other materials? And we've actually had conversations with manufacturers who have said exactly the same. We know which end of life component we want to investigate. We know which material we're going to extract from it. But we've got this big pile of stuff we don't want and we need help. We need a network to see if we can ethically dispose of that material. But there's also an opportunity. If you're shredding a multiple material component, there potentially will be some valuable materials in there, very small volumes, but potentially valuable. Rare earths, precious metals, and the so-called technology critical materials, the materials on the list. So there's actually an opportunity to gain value from shredding a component, not just to get your primary material, but also value from the other materials. But again, you'll need a network, a recycling network, to try and um, dispose of those in a a positive way. So I think it's fair to say that iSpace evolved from steel into steel and other materials. And that's why we want to talk to aluminium, plastics, glass, and other materials if there's scope. So one last point on the, the engagement side of things. When we talk to potential collaborators and project partners, we're asking them how they would engage with the plant. What challenges do they have relating to raw materials? What services do they need? What equipment might they need? And what their concerns are? And in this table, these are the options, the potential products and services that we think will be on offer. 
And because we've been talking to quite a few umbrella organisations, the trade bodies and sector organisations, one of, if not two of the most popular options are bringing together knowledge, contributing and disseminating knowledge and setting up networks, which is exactly what those trade bodies do. Now we've only spoken to one or two manufacturers, but the manufacturers are asking us to consider things like investigating certain end of life components so that they can extract a very specific material. And when they buy materials, they want to buy it to a, a, a specification, almost certified if possible. So even after just five or six months talking to stakeholders, we've got several letters of support, more in the pipeline, and we're starting to see how this plant might operate. However, during those conversations, there were also one or two misunderstandings or preconceptions. So it's important that I just point out a few key messages. So this plant is designed to separate materials from end of life components. Components, objects, consumer goods that have come out of use. The classic things where you've thrown them away because of the wrong color or you just don't like them anymore. Or it's a building that's been decommissioned or it's vehicles that are just sat in landfill. It is not designed to look at industrial waste, industrial byproducts. Now we're not totally ruling those out. If there's a good reason for us to support that, then we would consider it. But we need to be clear, this is a plan that will separate and sort valuable materials from end of life components, things that have come out of their use. The other issue that sometimes crops up is because we are going to be industrial scale and we will have the ability to process material at a commercial level, we need to make it very clear that we don't believe that we will operate in the, on the same scale as established waste management organizations. There is no way that we can compete with people who are already established in supplying raw materials. So we won't be a disruptor commercially. What we plan to be is a disruptor with respect to technology. So it's all about research and development and technology. And we need to be very clear, this is a UK facility for UK organizations. It's designed to make sure that the manufacturing industry has the ability to sustain itself and to have some sort of competitive edge. We wouldn't rule out collaborations with organizations that have a global reach or a, an international head office, but you have to be very clear, any information that's learned, any technology that's developed needs to have benefit for a UK organization, the UK manufacturing industry. And I just want to repeat, yes, the project team at the moment is very steel biased because of our backgrounds, but it's not just about steel, it's about a range of materials. So that was the communication program. Another activity where we put quite a lot of effort is actually characterizing scrap. Because if I'm going to stand here and say that our scrap needs to improve, and we've talked to plastics and glass manufacturers and they've got some improvements they'd like, if we're claiming that there needs to be an evolution, we need to understand what the starting point is and where we're going. So we've done a very rudimentary investigation where we've taken some steel scrap and we've characterized it. Now, bearing in mind that this is a laboratory scale um, investigation, we had to choose scrap that you could physically lift and manipulate. And we also had to think about the size of the scrap because we were putting it in a tiny bin furnace. So it's very small scale, but it's been quite an interesting uh, process. And to be fair, for people who aren't from the steel industry, they've never been out on plant and were starting to think about steel research it was useful for them simply to get their hands on scrap and understand what scrap is. And the process was very simple. We used a magnet to lift the magnetic scrap, put that to one side. We visually inspected anything that was left, to characterize it or put it into a category. We weighed all the different types, melted it, and then did a, a very basic chemical analysis. So starter still provided some turnings just standard turnings that they'd purchased through the normal routes. And you had lots of 
chips and spirals as you would do with turnings. So I haven't taken photos of those, but what we do have here is some of the oddments in the batch. So here, got lots of fangs. It was very difficult to believe that they were actually turnings. It looked more like dust. This is a clump. There were lots of clumps that had almost fused together. And then you've got all sorts of oddments. So even in a bag of turnings, only 88% of it was magnetic. And when we melted it, actually, you could believe that most of that was iron based on the chemical analysis that we got. Now, to be fair, if there's a few bits and pieces like this, and then somebody puts it in an electric arc furnace or a boss vessel, it's not really going to do any harm. But when you're talking about 88% of it was only magnetic, only 88% of it was iron, and you thought you were buying 100% iron, you might feel a bit aggrieved that you've paid for these sorts of things that really don't add anything to your steel. And that's one of the grievances the steel industry has. We also looked at fragmented metal. And it's a couple of observations here. Got two batches. They were delivered to the university, two different uh, occasions, probably came from two different scrap piles or deliveries at the steel plant. And they look very different. Batch one, you could believe is fragmented metal. Batch two, some quite interesting lumps in there. There's actually some components. Did they go through the shredder? Are they really fragmented metal? I don't know. But when all said and done, they were magnetic. They were predominantly iron, so it was okay. Or at least that's what the scrap merchants think. And in that batch, there were some non-magnetic, non-ferrous. And there's some quite interesting things. Why have we got rags? There's definitely some copper wire. Rubber, plastics, all sorts of bits and pieces. Now, thankfully, this batch was almost 100% magnetic. So again, does it really cause a problem if these things go in the furnace? Don't know. When we looked at the non-magnetic content for the turnings, there were actually turnings that were predominantly chrome, some were titanium, some were nickel. And some of them, even though they were non-magnetic, approximately 50% of them were iron. So even in the turnings, we got some very interesting uh, results. On a small scale, probably isn't going to cause any problems. On a large scale, if the quality went off, would it cause problems? Well, one of our steel makers does complain on a regular basis that they get flare when they're um, doing their boss treatments. And they do believe that it is from the scrap that they put in the vessel. And they use tin can bales. And tin can bales are notorious for looking beautiful on the outside and containing quite a lot of rubbish in the middle. So if we were to upscale that program, potentially we might get very different results. But for us, it was more about just learning about scrap, handling the scrap, and seeing what we would find. So summing up, we want or we're proposing to set up an industrial scale research and development waste processing plant designed specifically so people can do R&D on end of life components and recover accurate reproducible raw materials to a specified um, analysis and shape if that's what they want. The plant is going to be designed to assist people down this circular economy path, looking at zero waste, decarbonisation. And it will be a UK facility for UK organisations. And there's an aspiration that it becomes a centre um, of excellence with respect to knowledge and learning. So that UK organisations have got somewhere to come, whether that's for expertise, information, or actually use the equipment on site. And that really brings me to the end of my presentation, but I do have a request. If you're aware of any organisations that might be interested in this, 
please pass our contact details on because we are very much in the middle of a stakeholder engagement process. And what we found is that every time we speak to an organization, they tend to give our details to the next organization. And it's that rolling ball that's really paying dividends for us. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cathy. Uh, we've got quite a bit of time for some questions. So I'll open it up to the floor. Um, Cathy, uh, how much money do you envisage coming from the government for this project? A real little. I think what we'll get is uh, funding to make sure that we can um, carry on design, designing the business case. And I think you might find this once we're up and running that a lot of the research and development we do can tap into the standard funds. But in terms of CapEx for the equipment, construction of the building and operational expenditure, very little. I noticed Swansea University was mentioned several times and you said you're not quite decided where the plant might be. Uh, I think there's a hint there already, isn't there? Yes and no, because it comes down to the funder, to be honest. Dependent on who that funder is and what their rules are, then you know, that will be a big driver. Is it possible that it'll be in South Wales? Yes, but that's not the only location that we've been offered and we're looking at. One of the locations is further north. And actually, there might be somewhere in the middle of the country too. So yes, you're right. South Wales is ahead of the game, but we're very early in the process. Uh, we had a presentation last year at the Society uh, about a gentleman who talked about the circular economy for plastics and about how multi-material components were going to be legislated out. I think we're just seeing, starting to see the, an example of that where all our milk bottle tops have gone from blue, green and red to, to clear um, because clear plastic is much more recyclable than, than coloured plastic. Is there any legislation that's being introduced or is present that perhaps going forward will assist with some of the disassembly and sorting activities that this project is going to look at and will therefore make it easier to produce higher quality raw materials going forward? I think the most interesting piece of legislation that I'm aware of at the moment is this A design for dis uh, disassembly, but also making the manufacturers, the OEMs and the manufacturers responsible for their products when they come out of service. That's the one that's going to be quite interesting. In terms of designing components, um, you know, cars, washing machines, fridges, I don't see anything yet. The interesting thing will be is those components become more technologically advanced, actually more valuable and difficult materials to extract are going to go in them. So there could actually be a backlash with your smart fridge that's got some electronics in it. You know, there may be a drive to try and moderate that if you do put some um, semi-precious or precious metals in there you might find that there'll be some legislation to say that's got to come out because one of the things that Richard made me aware of is the fact that urban mining is a thing where landfill now is being mined to try and recoup some of these materials that a are in very short supply and b are very very valuable so legislation no but I think behaviours are definitely going to change. We've started with the trade bodies, that's our aim. So we've spoken to Alfred, RAP, which is plastics, um, which is still, British Stainless Steel Association, so we're looking at the different um, steels. We have also engaged with um, Innovate and the materials arm of KTN. So we've started with the umbrella organizations with the, the strategy that we want them to help us flow that message out. And actually, glass and plastics have been very engaged, a lot more engaged than we thought they would be. See, ooh. 
I think one of the problems is it's a mindset. So you're going into any steelworks, it's scrap. And throughout scrap industries, it's very much like that. People don't appreciate the value of scrap. You're absolutely so right. So we, we have it at work, you know, material at £10 a kilo, scrap value, and it's just scrap, and they don't see it. Well, interestingly, we've spoken to two um, scrapyard, well, a scrapyard manager and a guy who was a scrapyard manager but has moved into a different role. And I think the scrapyard manager is very enthusiastic about scrap. The issue is getting the purchasers, the buyers, educated and interested in the scrap. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the presentation, Kathy. Very enjoyable. Um, one of the reasons that scrap is not valued as it should be might be because of EU legislation where I don't know if it still is, but it was classified as waste. And that I, immediately puts a mocker on it. Yes. I get my hands wrapped when I talk about scrap and waste. I need to start and talk about various recycled materials as a resource. But actually, you're right. Um, when it's classed as waste, it puts a, con a completely different connotation on it. And in and I think in manufacturing industries, they are going to change the terminology. And I don't know if the legislation will change, but the behaviours and the perception is changing. But you're absolutely right, that connotation is detrimental. Check online if we have any online questions that anyone has asked. Uh, we don't appear to. So... Uh, thank you very much for tonight's presentation, Kathy. I think many people in this room have or currently work in industries where our raw materials are what other people would describe as waste, and we understand as users of those materials the value that they, they generate. I think it's the industries that uh, deal with those wastes as they are deemed and process them. It's about how can we process them and how can we get a a return on that waste, sell it on as quickly as possible and, and get make a profit on it without thinking about what this is challenging us to do, which is to improve that processing, maximise the value and also uh, maximise the recovery of the valuable materials that we are uh, inadvertently throwing away because, it, as we say, it's a small part, but perhaps a very scarce mm -hmm. and critical part. And I think we had the presentation last year about recovery of magnetic materials uh, rare earths and such like and it was clear there that the, the the risk of us running out of those materials and effectively going backwards technologically is is quite severe in the future and hopefully this will this project will come to fruition and will help the uk uh generate that circular industry and recover and continue to be able to produce uh, high quality materials without having to rely on certain less uh, stable parts of the world as we've all found it in the last 12 months it's not something that we can take for granted so thank you very much for tonight's presentation i'd like to give kathy a round of applause thank you